for a moment. And then I'm going to um, just pray for us before we... Um, oh, let me just do this. <laughs> Let's get this right. There we go. Um, and um, let's just pray before we sort of start it, that God can speak to us, even though we might have heard, heard some of these things many times before. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to open our community, our body that you've put us into, to others, so that they can come and see and they can experience your goodness and your greatness. And we pray that you'll open our ears and hearts to receive things afresh today, even if we've heard them before, and to be receptive to uh, new ideas and so that we can, in everything we do, give glory and honour to you and make our places that we meet together places of welcome and worship. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So what I'm going to do, first of all, is just to give you an overview of welcome. What is our attitude towards it personally? And I'm going to then look at a couple of Bible verses for direction and then end up by asking some relevant questions to start us off. Then I'll hand over to Daniel, who's going to focus on the welcome in our services and the events. And, and then Christine will look at the importance of a warm welcome uh, when there's no one there um, and there'll be obviously time for questions at the at the end as as we've said so the first thing i want to ask is to you personally what is your attitude to welcome and on a scale of one to ten where one is oh they can take me as they find me and ten is if anyone was coming to my home i'd make sure it was spotless and get out the best china where would you put yourself? So I just want you to think for a second. Are you more of a, a wanna, a bit quite laid back? Or are you a bit of a, a tenor? <laughs> uh, everything has to be just right and proper. And um, you can put that in the chat or you can keep it to yourself. I'm not asking you to criticize your choice of where you are. And when you've thought about that, I, I'm, I'm asking you that question because I want you to recognize that every single person is in a different place. And we get on particularly well with the, the people who are more like us. But when we're talking about welcome in our churches, we're not doing it alone. We're doing it with a wider group of people. And you need to recognize that some people will be at a one and you may be at a nine. And there is going to have to be some sort of compromise that doesn't mean compromise in how well we do things for the Lord. It's just that some of us would need to let things go a little bit that are not quite as important. And, other th and others of us will just have to buck our ideas up a bit. And so it's just to be aware of that when you start talking about welcome with a wider group of people. Because um, to work together and to create an environment which is generously welcoming to uh, anyone coming in, we, we neither need this don't care attitude, nor a perfectionism, which leads to a clinical delivery and, and then squeezes out the life and, and the presence of God. So where you are may not be where you stay. Um, so let's just <clears throat> have a look at a couple of biblical examples of that. And this is a very familiar passage to, to most of you, I would think, when uh, Jesus visits the home of Mary and Martha. And uh, it says about it, this, that um, a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus's feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do not care that my sister has left me to serve alone. Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, 
which will not be taken away from her. And we see Martha here at the sort of 9-10 end of the scale. We can see the effort that she's put into preparing everything and being so tied up with that sense of I want everything to be just right because Jesus is coming. And that's not a wrong attitude to have wanting to welcome uh, Jesus into her home. But what it does in this instance, it gets the focus completely wrong and leaves God out of the equation altogether. There's an interesting phrase that's used there. It says she's distracted with much serving. It's not saying that much serving is, is wrong. It's saying that when it becomes a distraction, we're getting the focus in the wrong place. And what is, is sad for me is that when we think of Martha, this is the first story. We, we think about this, this account. This is the first um, impression that we're, we remember often. Um, but I want to end up by on this passage by drawing your attention to what it says in John 12, when Jesus goes a second time. He's, he's often at Martha and Mary's house, but here it's recorded very simply that they met, there they made him a supper and Martha served. See, there's nothing wrong with that serving. It's almost like she's learned the lesson. On that occasion, she gets it right. And we can serve without getting distracted by serving. We can welcome without getting distracted by the intricacies of welcome and without getting burdened by it and annoying everybody else in our path as well. So that's at the 9-10 end of the scale. What about at the 1-2 end of the scale? And again, we have this account from Luke where Jesus goes to the house of Simon the Pharisee. And this uh, passage is more uh, well known for the fact that a woman comes to anoint Jesus's uh, feet uh, with oil. She, she uh, washes his feet with her tears and, and dries him with her hair and then anoints him with oil. But what I want to draw your attention to is uh, when she's done this, uh, and she is being uh, reviled by the Pharisees for actually doing this. Jesus turns, it uh, says he turns to the woman and says to his host, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. And when we see the water for the feet and the kiss, in that culture, today's equivalent would really be a handshake and a let me take your coat. The basics of a welcome into our homes. And Simon fails to give even the most rudimentary of welcomes to Jesus. And this shows really that he was a bit don't care about it. He was thoughtless, almost a selfish attitude. Jude. Maybe he was boasting that Jesus was coming to his house. So he was more concerned with him. But he, he was worried that maybe his reputation was at stake. But to not greet someone, to have a guest of honor and then not to do anything for them. Again, this is what we have at, at the one end of the scale. And sadly, I couldn't find a later example of a change in his attitude like I've been able to do with Martha. Maybe you have found one and uh, we could see him, him changing. And so th this is why we have to sort of compromise is, is a strong word, but really get, get the level of our welcome right. And the first question I'm going to ask you is this, are you expecting people to come to your church apart from those who normally come, who are not part of your usual congregation? Because the answer to that question has a great impact on how you're starting to think about welcome. If you're not expecting people to come, it may suggest that you've perhaps lost hope 
lost hope that people will ever come or that God can ever answer your prayer or change people's mindset or grow the church or, or whatever. And uh, unfortunately, if we're looking at a sort of a low expectation, uh, what happens is that the level of expectation usually will determine the level of effort you put in to that welcome. So you might be thinking, well, we may get somebody, so what's the point in bothering? So it needs really an active invitation, an active expectation that people will be coming into your churches. And it's really important to invite some, we invite people, invite different sorts of people. It may not be a personal invitation, but certainly to be able to, to bring others in. And the same negative attitude can cause people to sort of fall into depression and they stop doing the most basic of tasks like washing themselves and, um, and, and cleaning their homes. And, and this is what we don't want this, this um, spiraling down. So expect people will want to come. I'm just gonna look at two different things now. Why do people come to your church or why would they want to come to your church? And there's lots of different reasons for this. And when we're thinking about welcome, and Christine and, and Daniel will look at this afterwards as well, that the reason that they come can help you determine what you're going to do to welcome them. Uh, they could have a historical interest. You may have the, the largest spire in the county or the oldest font or something of that nature. And people are interested in that historical um, connection. There may be people who, whose great great grandparents married in your church and there's so much uh, ancestry and people looking into their uh, family history and, and the genealogies. And so people may come because of that. It's a great, uh, uh, there's a, a great website now, isn't there, where people can find out where their relatives are actually buried in, in which churchyard and, and where they are. And so it could be for that reason that people are um, visiting. It could be a, a, an association with someone famous. I've um, visited the a church which is particularly associated with Thomas Hardy, where he spent uh, his time with his, his wife and, uh, and also in a church recently where Brunel's mother attended and was very generous. And so that may be something that you can pick on, up on if that's uh, for you. It could be that there's great media attention just presently. Uh, maybe your church has been in the background where filming has gone on and people have gone, oh, look at that church. We'd like to go and visit that. And uh, people love to do that, don't they? Or it's the subject of a series or a TV program of some sort. It could be that walkers um, visit you. Um, there, could, there are walking routes. We know about the Saints Way. You might be on the junction of a Saint, the Saints Way, or uh, you may be on the route um, between two po points of, of interest and be getting people coming in. Have a think about who is likely to be coming in when they're just passing as well. It could be that someone told them about you and recommended that they come uh, to one of your services or you really must go and see that church at blah 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 um, and if your reaction to me saying that is like oh no nobody would ever do that then um, I think your focus probably doesn't need to be on welcome but <laughs> needs to be somewhere else you know God can bring people to your church People can recommend you and, and word of mouth is a great thing. So don't discount that at all. And you may need to think about why. If you really think nobody will ever come to your church ever for anything, then perhaps you need to be thinking about why. There could be the last thing I put down is a spiritual experience. And there's so many troubles. People are trying to find that place of peace and hope. And they will automatically associate that with a church. They automatically think that maybe in that church, maybe there's hope there, maybe there's peace. They may not even have any reference to, to God and faith, as it were, but they may associate that place of sanctuary. And it may be for that reason that they come. I tell a personal story of being in Austria. I was going from one um, 
a place, I, I had a placement in Czechoslovakia and then I had a placement in, in Switzerland and I was traveling through Austria. And I would check in occasionally with, uh, with home to see what was going on. It was, it was before the days of mobile and all of these great communications that we've got. And so I'd just ring very occasionally, as my mother would say, you should be doing it more often. But I rang, I was in my late teens and I, and I rang home, I was in Salzburg. And uh, she told me that um, somebody who I knew quite well, uh, who was just 21 years of age, had died very suddenly. They'd had a, a brain hemorrhage. They got off their bike. They were a sports person, very sporting. It was part of the community I, I was part of. I saw this person every week, week after week. Um, and it was a shock. I didn't really know what to do with that. I didn't actually have a faith. I didn't. I knew that God was out there somewhere. That was about it. And I, I didn't really know what to do. And I thought, well, there's a cathedral in Salzburg. I'll go into the cathedral. Maybe God's there. <laughs> Maybe I'll find something there. And I remember walking in and I walked up one aisle across the top and down halfway down the other. And I just thought, I'll just sit down a minute because I need something. And after just a couple of minutes, really sat down, probably not even that, someone tapped me on the shoulder. And it wasn't someone asking how I was. It wasn't someone uh, asking if they could help or saying welcome or um, uh, offering to pray for me. It was someone who told me that shorts definitely were not allowed in the cathedral, so please leave. Now, I don't make a habit of wearing inappropriate clothing to church. You will be pleased to hear. Uh, and I just didn't think about it. And sure enough, he marched me to the door and pointed to the sign, uh, which said no shorts. So, you know, I apologized. I, I hadn't seen that. But my uh, the thing I went away with was, well, God clearly isn't in the church because I'm sure if he was there, he'd want to help me. And so we have to be careful that we don't judge what people are there for or why they are there or, or put them off even further. And I will ex uh, give you an extra example of that, that, the complete reverse of that in just a second. Because the second lot of questions I've got, the last lot of questions is this. What do you want people to get out of your visit, whether it's on a Sunday, whether it's during the week when you're not there? I want you to look at these, uh, these options in the boxes. There's five boxes there. You want them to experience the presence of God, to hear about Jesus, to see that you've got a mission to the community, to see that you're the family of God, to be so welcoming they want to return, or to see that you're poor and need their financial help. Following on just from, the, I'll leave you a minute to look at that, uh, think about that for a sec. Following on from the experience in Salzburg, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, I was with some very good friends who, who run a quite conservative, very traditional church. And they were telling me that somebody had come into their church one Sunday, a, a young, a, a, a mature student, and they were dressed rather revealingly. And that instead of sitting in the main part of the congregation, uh, they decided to sit on one of the kids' benches at the side, which meant rather much more flesh was exposed than could have been if they'd been sat somewhere else. But my friend was saying that, I said, what, what did you do? She said, did we do the right thing? We were just having this conversation about it. Because it turned out this person had never come back to the church. And I said, well, what did you do? And she said, we spoke to her. We welcomed her the same as anybody else would. We tried to make it uh, that she knew exactly what was happening. We told her it was a traditional service. We offered to have tea and coffee afterwards. In fact, I invited her back to my home. Um, and they asked her if she wanted fellowship during the week. Um, they asked her if she needed prayer or had any needs. And I thought, wow, how gracious. And we don't have to compromise on our standards, if you like, at, at church. We don't have to fear 
we're not creating an anything goes atmosphere or a free for all. We're saying, this is how we worship God, but we want to love you. We love you. We don't, we're not going to judge you for what you look like. We don't know why you're here, but we want to welcome you. And I think we have to be quite careful sometimes that we don't judge. And I was really pleased that my friend told me, and I was just blessed by how gracious she was. But I want you to just look at those boxes again. And one of them for me really sticks out because the top right where it says, you know, what do you want people to know when they come? Do you, do you want them to know that you're poor and need their financial help? And I would say, please, I, I wouldn't want them to know that, actually. And you think, well, I thought you were the generous giving team. I thought you wanted us to have contactless machines and ask people to uh, help, help us. And well, of course. But what impression are you giving to people? How is it that you are asking for those things? And we might pick up on that later. What is it that you want first and foremost? And actually, I'd rather someone experienced the, the love of God and, and actually came and wanted to be part of a regular worshipping community than put 10 quid in the box on a one-off. Um, so pointing out to people that oh, we're really poor, please give us something, is probably not the first welcoming impression we want to, to take. And I'm going to leave you before I pass on to Daniel with a quote, not a quote from the Bible, but from a writer, a poet called Maya Angelou. And she says this, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And we really want to make people feel how welcome they really are. I'm going to stop there, stop my sharing and pass over to Daniel. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for that, Jenny. I'm just going to share my screen now. So building on what Jenny has been saying, I'm going to spend a little bit of time today thinking about welcoming visitors to our services. Um, and in that, I think I'm going to have a very particular focus uh, on what it might mean to welcome visitors that perhaps don't have the same uh, experience or depth of knowledge uh, of, of church, what churches do, um, as perhaps we might we might think they do, or indeed uh, people that might not consider themselves to be Christians at all. And in that, I guess the first thing uh, which I think is really important is to understand who our visitors might be. Uh, we might have a really good understanding of what church looks like and what Sunday morning looks like, but I think it would be a mistake to assume that that kind of knowledge uh, is universal, um, or indeed that the, the kind of familiarity that we think exists with uh, the church or the Anglican church still exists in a way that perhaps it once did. Statistically, only 13.1% of people report going to a religious service once a week or more, and only 10.7% of people who identify with the Church of England report attending church at least weekly. I guess uh, sometimes that statistic is used uh, in a quite a depressing manner to tell us uh, about the decline of the church. Um, but in the way that I'm reading that, I'm seeing that as, as both opportunity and challenge. Uh, opportunity in the sense that there are so many people out there that we can welcome into our churches and who we can share the message of Christ with and, and challenge because the vast majority of people are not familiar with church and what church looks like on a Monday, on a Sunday morning or indeed a Monday, Tuesday and midweek and what the function of the church is more broadly. And I think uh, particularly for younger people, um, that sort of familiar understanding of Anglicanism no longer exists. So whereas once upon a time, uh, even people that didn't go to church might have been familiar with what a Eucharist service looks like, I think um, it, it, it would be a mistake to assume that, um, that, that that understanding exists, that that familiarity is still there. I would say for lots of people that I come into contact with, um, if they went into a, a church and experienced the standard Book of Common Prayer Eucharist, they would be perplexed by what is going on. Um, and I, I think that that's also the case if we kind of take a step back and look at it and say, 
wow, well, yeah, what is it? What is it that we're doing here? What is it that people um, understand about that? I guess uh, a really good way of looking at this, um, my, my father-in-law studied um, a, a Bible college. It wasn't an Anglican Bible college, but he told me that as part of his training, one of his lecturers set him with a challenge, um, a, a homework that they all had to do. Um, and, it, and it was two parts. The first part was they had to go to a betting shop and they had to go in there and place the cheapest bet that they possibly could. Uh, on a horse, on a machine or whatever, but it had to be uh, a face-to-face -face interaction um, and they had to make an effort to speak to at least one person in there. And the second challenge was that on another day, they had to go to a service of a different faith tradition. And the challenge in that was uh, to put them in a situation that they were not familiar with, they were not comfortable with. Because whereas if, uh, say, one of us uh, went to a, a different Christian faith tradition, we might be a little bit confused, the music might be a little bit different, but in the broadest sense, we would be familiar with what's going on, right? It's normally a few few songs, a message, there might be a time afterwards for tea, et cetera. Um, and that, that's, that's quite a world apart with what it might be like to go into a betting shop or a, a different faith tradition. And the point there was that that kind of um, that sense of anxiety, that that even discomfort in the case of the betting shop that you feel um, that the judgment you might feel of going into a, a betting shop, that 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 feeling, that kind of essence is what a lot of people might be feeling when they walk into our churches, not not because we're doing anything wrong necessarily, but just because the gap between where we are and where people tend to find themselves now is, is growing. So what does that mean for us in terms of welcoming uh, visitors to our church? I guess the good news here is that I'm not here to say that, um, that, that certain expressions of worship are wrong, that we need to change them. Absolutely not. There is a richness of Christian tradition. Um, and, and indeed, in, in the Anglican Church, for lots of us, that's, that's traditional. It's centered on the Eucharist, the sacraments. And I'm not here to say that welcome equals um, adopting something different. Absolutely not. What I guess I am here to challenge us in is, uh, do we use welcoming language in our church services or do we sometimes use Christianese? Um, and if you haven't heard of the phrase Christianese, uh, it's kind of, I guess, sometimes a, a, a jokingly or even slightly a pejorative term to describe the kind of phrases that we often use in churches and in our Christian lives, which make complete sense to us. Um, but to those who aren't familiar with the church, um, come across as quite um, confusing, perhaps even unwelcoming, um, I might say. And there's a funny little graphic you can see here uh, that I found online, which is talking in Christianese and how we see ourselves and how all these phrases make complete sense to us. Um, but to non-Christians and people outside of the Anglican tradition, perhaps, um, it's, it's just very confusing and can be um, a little bit off-putting. I remember um, I invited a friend once to come to a, a, a Eucharist service. It was um, a spoken service. Um, and at the end of it, they said, that was really wonderful. The, the sensation felt really profound. I really felt like, like I met, met, met God or something like that. But they said, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't really understand what was happening, why it was happening, and a lot of the phrases we were using. So what does this mean on a Sunday morning for us? Well, I think it can be as simple as just making sure that um, when we know there are visitors, if we if we know that there are people there that might not perhaps be versed in this kind of lexicon and language, that we're just making an effort to explain what our liturgical terms mean or why we're doing particular things in the church. Uh, so, for example, and I've got a, a fun selection here of uh, phrases uh, that might come up in church life, the blessed sacrament, the general intercessions, the gospel acclamations, the communion rite, a deacon, a vestment, the chalice, the lectionary, the altar veneration, a genuflection. Those terms might mean a lot to us and be so central to our church life, um, but I think it's a, a mistake to assume uh, that those are particularly self-evident. 
And indeed, beyond language, uh, I think there's also a place for explaining different parts of the service. So, for example, lots of churches and indeed uh, my own church stand for the gospel reading uh, as, a, as a sign of respect. Um, but again, this friend who came to the service told me that they were very confused why all of a sudden everyone stood up and, and it, 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 it wasn't it wasn't explained. And I guess, um, you know, if, if your if your church community um, is pretty stable and everyone there understands what's what's going on, then perhaps every week, you know, you don't need to say we're now going to stand for the gospel reading as a, as a sign of respect or similar. But I guess it's being conscious of, of who's in the church and uh, what they might be feeling. And indeed, this kind of uh, message about um, our language and our culture, I guess, also extends to thinking about uh, children and young people um, in our services. And I guess the question is, are children made to feel welcome uh, in your church? I think we've moved past, uh, thankfully, uh, or at least in lots of the uh, contexts that I've, I've kind of worshipped in, that kind of uh, feeling that, that children have to be completely silent in the church service, or if they're not, that they you know, need to be sent elsewhere, or indeed that, that children shouldn't be part of the life of the church in that way. I think we're past that. But sometimes, um, perhaps um, because we don't always have children in our services or just because there isn't the, the capacity or the volunteers to do it, um, it can kind of get neglected a little bit. And we, we forget what it might look like to welcome children and young people. Um, I'm not a youth worker. Um, I'm sure that uh, it's a, a topic all in itself of how we welcome uh, children and young people into our church. But even really simple things, which I know so many churches do so well, uh, creating a corner with toys and a carpet and soft furnishings that just kind of stands as a, as a visual testament in the space of the church to say we have considered children in the life of the church and we have created space for them to feel welcome um, and I guess the, the, the pushback against that might be oh well we, we don't have any children um, or young people at our services and I, and I guess that that's true but um, one Sunday you might and wouldn't it be absolutely wonderful if instead of having to to scramble on a Sunday morning to think ah what should we do what should we do if you already had a, a box of resources at the back that you could pull out and uh, set up in a in a designated corner. Great. I think another part then about um, welcome on a Sunday morning, um, and I, I don't want to teach anyone to suck eggs, because if I know anything about our churches in Cornwall is that people do do a lot of this on a Sunday morning and, and make people feel so welcome. But I guess it, it, it comes to questions of, you know, do we have someone at the door on a Sunday morning that is welcoming guests in and kind of, you know, uh, if there's any paperwork, uh, papers that they're going to need or the Book of Common Prayer, making sure that that people have them, uh, letting them know where they can sit or et cetera. I think the worst thing that could happen is, um, particularly if you're doing a Eucharist service, if someone comes in and there's no one to greet them, if they don't pick up the Book of Common Prayer and then everyone starts saying things together, they're going to feel really confused and they might feel a little bit silly. But again, if there isn't someone welcoming them there uh, to let them know that, that can kind of slip through the cracks. There's nothing warmer and more inviting, I think, than the smiling face of someone at the door on a Sunday, welcoming you in, uh, letting you know that you're, you're home, you're in the home of Christ with the gathered body of believers, and that you are so welcome in that space. You're not a hindrance at all, but rather invited and wanted. Indeed, after the service, are we chatting to visitors and creating relationships? I think it can be uh, really tempting, and I know that I'm guilty of this uh, sometimes, after the church service, um, immediately going to your, your friends, if you like, the people that you're comfortable with. And indeed, that is part of church life because we are a community. So you want to speak to the people you know, you want to have fellowship with them. But sometimes um, the worst thing that can happen, and I've, I've seen it happen a few times before, is when there is someone who is so obviously new to the church and they're kind of uh, after the service sitting awkwardly. Um, and, and indeed, COVID made this so much worse and no one um, goes to approach them and no one goes to say hello. Um, and so they kind of sit there awkwardly for five minutes, kind of waiting for uh, someone to be brave and chat to them. And uh, if no one does, they might they might leave. And that will be the end of that. 
are we being intentional as individuals in churches or as leaders in churches to to have a culture of chatting to visitors to getting to know them uh, to to asking them why are you here today um it's lovely to have you what is it about um this church or church in general that has made you curious to join us this morning, creating relationships um, with people. And I, that might be a case that um, on a Sunday morning, um, you might have um, one or two people who are the designated uh, visitor chatters. Um, and they've kind of agreed and volunteered that if there are any visitors that they'll they'll go up and strike that conversation. Or indeed, uh, it might happen quite organically, um, but we can just be quite conscious, I think, of creating that culture of, uh, of welcome that, that no one is left to sit alone on a Sunday morning. And finally, um, what I want to touch upon quite practically uh, before handing back over to Christine is uh, facilitating uh, return. How do we make sure that people feel welcomed uh, and invited to come back again uh, on a Sunday or indeed engage with the life of the work during the church? Um, and I, I think the answer here um, is quite easy, uh, thankfully, and it's that um, we create the relationship and we and we ask. Um, you know, we invite people, we say to them, it would be lovely to have you again next week. Um, or if, if, if you've kind of set up a, a welcome rotor and that's something that you kind of do, if you have a designated person who reaches out in that way saying, let's have your uh, mobile number if, if that's something you'd like and we can uh, put you in touch, go for a coffee, etc. Uh, find out what it is that's brought you to church and, and what the life of this church might be like for you. Um, some churches like to use visitor forms, um, and I, I, I've seen that work well. Um, you know, it kind of asks for your name, uh, it, what's brought you there, is there anything you're looking for, for prayer, to chat to a vicar, perhaps, if you're interested in a particular uh, sacrament, if you're interested in baptism. Uh, visitor forms work well, um, but I tend to think, and I, I don't think there's a right or wrong here, but a lot of that same information can be gathered uh, relationally um, by speaking to, to people as opposed to kind of just jotting it down. Um, and also visitor forms get lost all the time. Um, you know, they might go in the back of the cupboard and, and, and not be dealt with for, for months and months. Um, and finally, the last point um, I, want, I want to leave with is uh, also be sure not to overwhelm either, because um, I think that can definitely happen. Um, some churches are very, very welcome very very welcoming uh, but it can be overwhelming and I have a, a memory here of when I was uh, moving to a, a new a new city um, starting a new job a couple of years after I finished university I was kind of um, visiting churches kind of seeing um, the, the the village I lived in didn't didn't have a parish church it had been shut down and so I was kind of um, visiting the nearby ones and um, people were so welcoming uh, but there was one particular example where I can kind of remember getting sort of uh, near daily phone calls um, <laughs> you know uh, asking me if I was coming the next week and uh, text messages and things like that um, which was really lovely because it made me feel so wanted but it was a little bit overwhelming um, and I guess that's just the balance that we kind of strike uh, in life anyway. I hope that was uh, helpful um, and if anyone has any particular questions about um, what it might mean to to welcome young people the missing generations um, I'd, I'd be more than happy to to share my experiences and indeed the experiences of, of, of people I know in that demographic because um, I know that that's um, yeah that's that's on the hearts of many of us. Christine over to you. Thank you very much Daniel that's really helpful. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen now. Um, there we go. OK, so I'm going to look a little bit now on how to welcome people to an open church, to welcome people when we're not in the church, but just to our church building. So how can we welcome people when we're not there? How can we give that that feeling of that welcoming smile of those welcoming words without actually being there to give those so firstly I would really encourage you to keep your church open if you can so that people can come in many people like to just visit to drop in on a church many people like just to go into a church to sit in peace and God's presence and just just soak up that peace of the church um, so it's really important to keep the church open and to make it clear when it's open there's a nice picture here from Probus Church uh, with a welcome saying that the church is open, giving the times when it's open, um, even though 
often it's open for longer than that, but so that people know exactly when when they can visit um, so they don't feel that that it's it's never open. And just think about what you want people's first impressions to be when they come to your church. Um, we just need to find ways to share God's love in that same way as we would with our welcoming smile uh, with visitors who come in, even if we're not there, how can we share God's love and how can we give that, that generous welcome? So first of all, what are, what are people's first impressions when they come to, to see the church from the outside? Um, I, I remember when I first uh, came to live in Cornwall about 19 years ago now, I first came to live in Cornwall. My, my husband got a job in St. Austell. I'd never even been to Cornwall before and I came to St. Austell with him for his job interview. Um, looked around the town to see, you know, would I like to live here or not? Or shall I tell him if he gets a job, I'm not going there. And one of the first things I did was to go up to the church in, in the town and have a look at the church. And I did get this sense of a real welcome that the notice board outside was welcoming, the church was open. And although there was no one there, the notices, the, the colours, the, the, the beauty of the place just really gave me that feeling of welcome. And that's the kind of first impression that we want people to have, to, to feel that that's a place that they could really be at home. So some of the things to think about of the outs for, for the outside of your church, parking is, is a big problem for people, making it clear where people can park. And if there isn't parking at the church, maybe some sort of direction to where they might find suitable parking. But thinking about access to your church as well, making sure your pathways are clear um, and tidy so that, that buggies can get down and people with limited mobility or in wheelchairs can easily access your church. And, if those things aren't in place, just think, think about little things that you could put in place to make things easier for people. That way, as they're approaching your church, they immediately feel welcome. They feel that they, they've been thought about. There's somebody there thinking about providing for them. As I said, the signs and the notice boards, make your notice boards attractive on the outside with information of when the church is open, when the services are taking place, all those things so that people know oh yeah, this is the place that I can come to and I can, I can be welcomed. Um, there's some nice pictures there, a nice uh, church open sign again um, at Philac, which can be taken down, which can be put back up. And um, it's really obvious to people that they are welcome there. And I love this picture at the bottom, just little touches that really make people feel welcome. A little bowl of water for, for the dog, a little basket of plants that people can, can take away just little touches, people have really thought about who might be visiting, those, those walkers with their dogs, those people who might like something to take away. Um, and it just makes people feel, oh yes, there's somebody here thinking about me. Um, it's really important that the churchyard is attractive, put in some flowers, just keep it tidy, keep it clean. Maybe put in some seats for those people who just want to, want to rest there. Um, and just enjoy the beauty and, and enjoy God's presence. Uh, yeah, I love this little sign, which is the transition now from outside to inside your church. It's just a little sign um, in a church doorway. Um, I'll just read it for you. It says, God, make the door of this house wide enough to receive all who need human love and fellowship, narrow enough to shut, shut out all envy, pride and strife. Make its threshold smooth enough to be no stumbling block to children, nor to straying feet, but rugged and strong enough to turn back the tempter's power. God, make the doorway of this house the gateway to thine eternal kingdom. It's a wonderful prayer which gives people a sense of that physical welcome, but also that spiritual welcome. Um, and it's a lovely thing to read as you enter the church. There's another little, a little sign there from another church as well welcoming people into to the beautiful church for meditation for prayer so inside the church then when somebody comes into your church you don't want them to go into a dark damp untidy unwelcoming church and i'm sure i'm sure most of your churches aren't like that but there are some churches that are you go in and it's just very dark and and it just you don't feel welcomed into it so try and work on your church being clean, being attractive, having a light that um, 
that just just uh, lightens the place up so that people when they come in they feel that they're coming into a, a beautiful place you may want to have a welcome table in your church with a visitor's book make sure the visitor's book is there where people can see it they can read what other people have said and they can leave their own um comments there but to have beautiful things on the welcome table things that will attract people and again uh, give people that sense that that people from the church are thinking about how to welcome them and how to make them feel at home um, giving information about your church is really helpful a lot of people come to your church as Jenny was saying maybe because of the historical interest maybe just because you know it's a, a, a beautiful building that they're interested in in finding out about so providing information in some places they do that in these wonderful big uh, interpretive boards if they've got some real interesting history that they want to share but but that's not necessary you could even just have a small little leaflet or a little piece of paper with um, some basic information about the church so people can read or some nice posters and notice boards with information about the history of the church and about what goes on in the church maybe you're a church that does wonderful things in the community has wonderful links provides different um, uh, activities and resources for the community and those are things that you can share as well to to give people a sense of the life of the church and and the life of the people that are uh, uh, worshipping there um, again with your notice boards some notice boards uh, are just full of a4 paper with text on but try and brighten up your notice boards put pictures share what the church is doing show pictures of the different people who are using the church so that people again can get a sense of what's going on there think about leaving a gift for people to take away maybe some physical refreshment i'll show you a, a lovely picture in a moment of one church that does that but something that they can take away maybe if walkers are coming through your church they can take a bottle of water or a snack away with them or just leave a sign saying help yourself to to refreshments while you're here as Daniel was saying, think about children as well. Children are often dragged into churches by their parents, but make those children welcome as well. And if the children feel welcome, the whole family feels welcome. Provide an area for them to play. Or perhaps think of making a little children's trail or family trail. Again, just on a sheet of paper with questions, with things to look out for. And that helps share something of your history, but it also helps the whole family to be involved with an activity in the church. It's just some lovely pictures. There's a little children's corner in one church that's left there when the church is open. It's not just for a Sunday morning, but it's it's there for people to enjoy during the week if they pop in and and no one's there. And then in Mevagissi, this basket of goodies for for walkers who are coming by just to to help themselves and a little sign there saying welcome, enjoy. And it just again it makes people feel that someone is thinking of them. And if if you get those kinds of people coming through your church, it's something worth thinking of but also providing something for spiritual refreshments a lot of people will come into your church to pray or just to be at peace um, and provide some resources so that they can really um yeah just enjoy that time with god and um, there's a picture here of a prayer tree i know a lot of churches have these where people can write a prayer on a piece of paper and hang it onto the tree um, and it's just a physical sign in other churches People will have candles that they can light to say a prayer for a loved one, different ways of, of, of doing that. And the picture at the bottom shows the lovely creative prayer station with different things that people can do whilst they're praying, physical signs of, of prayer. Um, and it's also really attractive. It's a way of just uh, bringing people in and helping them to pray and helping them to, to focus on God. I said there are two free Christian resources to take away. Um, there's a picture here of one church where they provide these, these Christian resources so people can take them away. And again, people feel welcomed when there's something on offer for them. Um, and the picture on the right here are just some little prayer cards that we produce at the diocese. Those are just a selection of them. There's, there's a whole set of them on different subjects. Um, these can just be left in the church so people can pick them up. If they're troubled, they can pick up the one saying, Lord, I'm troubled. And on the back there, there's a lovely prayer that can help them to pray for people who are maybe not so used to just praying 
in their own words, but to, to have a, a lovely prayer that they can focus on and can really help them connect with God. Finally, as, as Jenny said, we're generous giving advisors. So we're thinking about giving and, and, and how we can encourage people to contribute to the church as well. So it's, it's important to have that information available, but it shouldn't be the overriding message when people come into your church. First of all, they need to feel that welcome. They need to feel that, that smile from you and that smile from God as well. They need to feel that, that welcome. But the giving information should be there. It might be what they see on their way out of the church. Um, and, um, but that, that invitation to give and to contribute to the church should some, be something that's attractive to them, not just saying give now and give here, but something that's attractive. It communicates the impact of, of that giving. It communicates what's that, what that's needed for. The, the picture on the right here is from St Agnes Church, and this is together with their contactless giving machine. And it just asks very gently um, whether people would like to give a donation. And it says that they hope that they've enjoyed their stay and experienced something of God. Um, so it's, it's a, just a, a lovely way of asking people whether they might like to consider giving. And the, the picture on the left here from Probus Church is just communicating that impact of, of people's gifts. So showing people what's going on in the church and just giving them that choice whether they want to give or not. Um, so those are all things just to, as I say, just to help people to feel that welcome in the church when nobody is there to, to say, come in, welcome, but communicating that love and that welcome through what we what we leave in the church and how we leave our churches okay i'm going to stop there um, and i think we have a few minutes left for questions if anyone has questions for any of us or comments it doesn't have to be questions please just type those into the chat box or the question and answer box i don't think we have any yet i don't know if anyone else has seen any but I don't think there's any there, but if you have anything, please um, just pop that in there now. Um, if not, we'll we'll tie up in a moment. Okay, I don't think there are any questions. Well, I hope that you've all found that helpful. Um, do get in touch if you'd like. Um, to look at this subject more. There is, there is um, uh, a pack which many of you, you may have seen called A Way to Welcome, which is something that we could work through with you as a church if you'd like us to, or we can just come and have a look at your church and just bounce some ideas with you of how you could, how you could um, incorporate some of these ideas and make your church a welcoming place for, for visitors to services or to the open church. Um, Jenny or Daniel, do you have anything to say to finish or? No? Okay, we'll finish there. Thank you all for coming. Um, and we'll be in touch soon with the, with the slides for you. Okay, thank you, bless you.